Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Wide Open Throttle. The good news, we've got a great panel and some interesting topics to discuss. The bad news, you have to put up with me rather than the lovely Jesse Lang, who's out on assignment. So let's kick it off. And we'll kick it off with uh, something that appeared on a recent episode of Epic Drives, the Ford Raptor. Art, you took it out into the Mojave Desert. Great landscape. Tremendous fun. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk, is the Raptor really relevant these days? And uh, people are so concerned about gas mileage and it's expensive. And, and yet Ford is outselling their own projections. I think they sold more than 13,000 last year. Um, still, there's that market that wants this very capable, very cool looking truck that can basically do whatever you want it to do. I mean, I've always loved it in that it's one of the really well thought out manufacturer specials. I, I think I once called it the GT3 of trucks because it, it made you feel like a desert racer in there. The suspension was set up, you know, it yeah. really worked as a, as a truck. Well, the true genius is that they can build it on the same line as the F-150. I mean, it, it clears uh, the aisles, which, the, you know, the car, the, the, the manufacturing lines that the, the trucks go down, and that they're just making so much money off of it, too, because it's, it's a, a yeah, cash, big cash cow. cow for them. And, uh, and the cool thing about it is all this race technology actually makes it like Land Rovers uh, happen to drive great on the road because partly they're so uh, smooth and soft off-road. Same thing for this Raptor with those long travel Fox shocks. It's got a great ride. Uh, I can see why it's very popular. Is anyone shocked that Ford actually built a truck like this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is, I mean, desert racing is, is, is a lot of fun, but it's a pretty particular niche, you know? And they tackled it and delivered 100% on what the truck can do. I mean, that truck is the most fun you can have in a stock vehicle off-road. I feel like a kid in a toy box or a sandbox, just doing Sorry. donuts and power sliding. And It might be too much fun. We've seen a lot of the, we've seen a lot of the videos of why are you of, looking at me of, <laughs> of, of owners taking them off road and uh, maybe going a little bit uh, maybe too fast or hitting yeah. jumps a little too much speed. I, I can see why your driver is singing. You get that you know that R Kelly song. Or is it R Kelly? I believe I can fly. Right. You know, and you can. <laughs> But the landings don't work so well, you yeah. know, once you take it beyond a certain level. It's got that superhero aura to it, and uh, so you want to push it. And most of the time, it's absolutely fine doing that. And uh, it was certainly a blast to go around Dumont Dunes with it uh, in the Mojave. So how, how does Ford follow up on, on a truck like the Raptor? What do, what do they do next? It, it, uh, I'd be curious, because the crazy thing is they were doing this research basically around the time of the, the Great Recession. It was collapsing all over them. And this thing, I think, got greenlit right before uh, you know, the, the poop hit the fan. So do they stay in in racing, in, in desert racing? I think you would have to believe they would because it's done so well. They'll just wait for the next generation of maybe the Atlas concept, I and mean, that would be pretty cool. Um, I just hope they do things like reinforce uh, the frame where the cab and the bed <laughs> meet. Uh, we, I know we had an issue with that in one, of the, one of the times when we launched Seems it. Seems to be the weak point. Yes, it? yeah, they can only take so much suspension travel before the bed becomes a, you know, member that absorbs the rest. But they really hit a, a, a brilliant you know, market because sure, this truck's gonna satisfy a lot of the off-road guys, but then there's also a lot of the white collar, blue collar guys who may not even go off-road, but they just wanna have a yeah. cool truck yeah, mm -hmm. and they're gonna buy a truck anyway. Why not buy, the, uh, why not buy this one? Yeah. You know, it's gonna give them all the street cred. It's also gonna drive nicer than a standard F-150 mm -hmm. and make awesome sounds and have that capability. So, you know, why hasn't Chevy jumped onto this? Why hasn't Dodge, you know, Dodge has played around a little bit with it, but why haven't they jumped onto this? Dodge has the, the, the power wagon, which is, they say is a, a, a slightly different take on it. It's more of a, it's almost like a recovery vehicle, like massive amount of torque, uh, rock crawling, 4x4. Four four. GM, I just don't, I don't think they have that. They don't, well, they no longer have like a true SVT division, and I, I guess I would imagine maybe the volume is too small for them. 13,000 units for Ford, and they really own the high ground, so mm. there may not be anywhere else for anyone to go. That's right. Okay, so that's a wrap on the Raptor. Time to change gears a little and uh, go to something completely different, Tesla Model S pretty controversial story appeared in the New York Times recently and the aftermath has been equally controversial. Do you have the background on the story? So John M. Broder, New York Times um, reporter, was going to drive a Tesla from Washington to Boston and check their East Coast supercharger network. Uh, basically he got I think almost there, he basically ran out of juice and had to call a flatbed. There was a lot of controversy, as, as you said, around this. And I think one of the biggest issues was 
um, the fact that uh, you know Tesla called him out. Elon Musk said the, the test was fake. Obviously, um, you know, we took uh, the Tesla on multiple long-range tests. Uh, Ed drove it yeah. uh, from back from Vegas to, uh, to LA. Um, so you kind of have to know what you're doing with this car. And I think uh, the New York Times reporter probably didn't know exactly what he was doing. Yeah, I, I think it's it's an interesting interesting back and forth. I got a lot of people asking me on Twitter, uh, what are you doing? What's your response? Again, we were the first uh, outlet in the world to do any kind of range testing on the Model S. We did three separate drives. We did one down to San Diego and back. And then Frank Marcus and Jesse Lang, uh, in a video that the link will appear right down here, uh, went to um, Vegas on, one, on a single charge. And then I flew in and drove it back. And I will say that, you know, the, the, this guy Broder at the New York Times made a ton of mistakes. I think it's pretty clear that um, he wasn't quite uh, as knowledgeable as he could have been about charging the vehicle. You know, there are all sorts of questions of why he didn't, you know, use the supercharger to the maximum capacity of the vehicle. Now, having said all of that, when I came uh, to Vegas to drive the Model S from the Aria back to our headquarters here in El Segundo, uh, I made a ton of mistakes. I was so caught up in the logistics of getting the car to our team and working the whole thing that when I finally was handed the keys and I looked at it, I realized that I didn't know how to drive the car. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God. And I thought back to what our, our testing director, Kim Reynolds said. He said, you know what? Just get in, the car starts itself and you'll figure it out in five minutes. And I did. But I also made a number of key mistakes on the way back. And I was trying to conserve electricity by doing what I thought would have been smart, which is to open the windows. Well, hmm. you don't do that. You know, <laughs> Increases drag. You increase yeah. drag at the expense of, yes, I'm not running the AC system, but as I found out later, the Tesla engineers were like, the AC is so efficient that the drain on the draw on the, on the battery is actually a lot less than the drag you're inducing by having the windows open. So, you know, I made a fairly major mistake, still made it back 285 miles uh, total range with three miles left and I was sweating a little bit and you know, I drove kind of slow <laughs> on the way back but um, Definitely a, a nightmare I think for both the New York Times and Tesla. Well electric cars aren't the aren't a direct substitute for a gasoline engine internal combustion engine vehicle you can't do exactly the same things they're designed for slightly different jobs Tesla clearly wants to position the Model S as the electric car that can do everything in internal mm -hmm combustion engine car can. But the laws of physics are immutable. The batteries can only <coughs> hold a certain amount of energy and you've got to learn to manage that. So I think the New York Times reporter was looking to, to make that point. I think what bothers me most about this story though is that there's an inherently defeatist attitude going in uh, with a lot of technology. And yeah. I see people pick up these wondrous smartphones, the supercomputers in their hand basically. They can talk to any human being in the world. And they start complaining because it takes five seconds to download their cat video. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing with these cars. You know, here we have this wondrous machine that can go well over 200 miles. It's faster than any of the sedan in the United States. Um, it's beautifully designed. It's cutting edge. And Musk and his team are putting in these supercharging stations faster than I would have ever guessed. And yet they still, they're complaining. They're, they're wringing their hands. It's, it's not good enough. You know, it doesn't work. Well. I can't get into a gasoline-powered car and drive from here to uh, Washington, D.C. without stopping to get gas. Uh, it has a certain limited range you must adhere to, and so does the Tesla, and that range is more finite. Uh, but, but the fact that this thing is out there and they, they are pushing the envelope and it is cutting edge, I still applaud everything the company is doing. Well, well, what? Your technology point, Louis C.K. has a great statement about that. He says, everything's great and nobody's happy. That's, that's yeah. right, <laughs> exactly. But there is, you know, with a new type of propulsion uh, system, you know, electric energy, it takes, there's gonna be some teething problems. Mm -hmm. where people, you can't treat it like gasoline, nor could you treat gasoline like horses. You know, there's just, you have to understand that there are some different rules working with it. And once you understand what those rules are, you can use it more easily. I, I mean, I think we learned two things out of this whole fiasco is that one, uh, Elon Musk is really not one to mess with. I mean, he's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna come out swinging yeah. and swinging hard. Um, but I also think the other takeaway is that, you know, your mileage will vary. You know, we did three long-term yeah. tests, all over 230 yeah. miles. We didn't, our, our very first one with Kim and Benson, when they were driving from El Segundo to San Diego and back, they didn't make it. We had to stop within three miles of our office and pull over and get Thai food and bug the thing in a charge point station at, next to a, a Walgreens. Frank made it 
to, uh, to Las Vegas, no problem. You know, a little bit sweaty. I made it back, but you know, your mileage will vary. And it really does vary on terrain, temperature, your driving style, and truly, I think as Boder demonstrated, your preparation and knowledge of the vehicle. Okay, so let's go from one different kind of powertrain to another one, diesels. And they're starting to catch on in the United States with SUVs, but why no sporty diesels? They're all over Europe, but not here yet. What's going on? Well, it's a tax problem for one thing. I mean, uh, Europe has always tried to make diesel fuel more uh, attractive with lower taxes on it than it is here. And I'm not sure exactly what the price is, but it's something like 10 to 20% more to build a diesel engine than a gas engine. On the other hand, I think diesels make a lot of sense for American drivers. There's lots of torque. They like to pull away fast from stoplights. You know, all the ones we've driven, we've really liked. Our BMW 335D was a spectacular car. And uh, it's range. a shame. Range, range. too. Range. Range. Yeah, well, when the cost is higher, the energy content's greater. Yeah. So you can actually you know, do a lot more with diesel in a tank than you can with gasoline. I think in a sporty car, though, I have some sort of hesitation with taking that on because to me, a sporty car has, you know, naturally aspirated engine that revs to the stratospheric uh, red lines and diesels don't do that. When we were driving the GTD, my big annoyance with it was I'd be on the gas, the engine would stop accelerating, it was so quiet, I'd look down and see the tack just doing this <laughs> off 4,000 RPM. I was like, oh, okay, an upshift. And there's not a lot of satisfaction uh, in ringing out an engine like that. Mm -hmm. So you don't like Vipers? They're low, low torque, you don't? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, but it, they do remind you, and, and I'm probably you know, the, old, the only one here old enough to have driven a Peugeot 205 GTI in, in Europe. It was a gasoline engine car, but Peugeot's never had big top end. It was all mid-range, and you short-shifted them all the time, and you, mm. were, from point A to point B, were quicker than almost anything oh, else sure. because you're just surfing the torque. And surely you can do that. With a sporty diesel is not necessarily a com contradiction in terms. It's, no. it's not. I think the, the VW GTD is, is a good example and the 335D, but I think the big problem is that diesels, diesel as passenger cars have yet to really penetrate the market. So how can we expect this niche on the sporty side to happen when we don't even have significant volume as in passenger cars or even SUVs? I mean, all the Germans are making them. Uh, Jeep Grand Cherokee just came out with a, they announced the diesel, so we'll see that. But when we start looking across the, the wider segment of vehicles, what else is there? Chevy Cruze uh, just announced a diesel. That's Ma it. Mazda couple, 6. Mazda 6. A couple of Volkswagens yeah. here and there. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and Audis. Well, the Volkswagens sell very well, by yeah. the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like 30, but you know, 40%. even though the penetration isn't that high, every single time we hop in one of these, we always say the same thing. Why aren't there more of them? Yeah, but we love weird stuff. <laughs> station wagons and diesels. We love wagons. We love minivans. A diesel you know. station wagon. It's the greatest wagon. thing in the world. <laughs> totally. There you are. Love it. Yeah. yeah. So, long term, it's going to take a while. I think I think SUVs are, are going to lead that. I mean, Audi Q7s, Mercedes uh, NLs and GLs, mm. uh, the take, and BMW X5s, the take up on diesels there is getting, what, 30% of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same with the VW diesels. I mean, the, um, the passenger cars, they do sell a lot of them here. But um, we'll see when the domestics finally you know, roll this stuff out. Okay. All right, thanks guys. That's all for this week on Wide Open Throttle. So make sure you tune in next week and check out all the stories on motortrend.com. Until next week, bye. Cheers. 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 Cheers.